Okay, thanks for hanging in there as we go through some of the most important points of the FAFSA. This time, it's the financial section. The financial section is in two parts. One focuses on the student's finances, the other on the parent's finances. This is the part where you'll have to get some of your financial documents together first. The list of documents include your 2008 tax return, your W-2s, any investment reports, your bank account statements, and any documentation about other assets, such as a business you own. Gathering your documents before you begin working on the financial section is really important if you're going to do the FAFSA online. Remember, the online FAFSA won't let you progress without answering each question, one after the other. So, have your documents in hand before logging on. One more thing, if you are an independent student, you only need to provide financial information about yourself and if you're married, your spouse. If you are a dependent student, you will need to provide financial information for yourself and your parents. You'll find the student's financial section of the FAFSA in step two in the paper form. For the online FAFSA, they're in step four. Financial questions for parents are in step four of the paper form and in step three online. Many of the answers to these financial questions can be found in your 2008 tax return. That's why it's important to complete your federal income tax before filling out the FAFSA. The FAFSA will show you where to look on your completed tax return to find the answers to these questions. And you don't have to file your taxes before you complete the FAFSA. In the financial sections, both students and parents will be asked to enter their total wages along with the value of their bank accounts, savings accounts, and any investments that are not held in retirement accounts. It's important to answer all of these questions accurately. Students and parents will be asked to provide the total amount of taxes paid to the IRS in 2008. Make sure that you enter the amount of taxes paid, not the amount of taxes withheld. You will also be asked to provide the net worth of any of your investments. But these do not include any retirement accounts you may have or the value of your home. Some examples of investments include stocks, bonds, rental homes, 529 college savings plans, and refund value of 529 prepaid tuition plans. For students reporting parents' income, these accounts are reported as the parents' investments in question 92. For a student who isn't reporting parents' income, these savings plans are included in question 42. It's important to let it be known who holds which investment. For instance, if a student owns some stock, that would be recorded in his or her financial section. Investments owned by parents would be entered in the parent section. The additional financial information sections for students and parents also require you to account for any income that's in addition to your regular wages. Students will be asked to report any money that was received or paid on their behalf. If you received financial support from someone other than your parents, you would include that amount here. Parents, you'll need to report any child support that was paid to you. One important note, if child support payments for your college-bound student end this year, you must still report the amount you received in 2008. You can ask your school's financial aid office to exclude this income when they review your application. But for now, you must include it. You'll be asked to report any hope and lifetime learning tax credits you took in 2008. These are tax credits that offset some of the cost of an undergraduate degree. The FAFSA tells you where to find this information on your tax return. In addition, the financial information section asks for any child support you paid in 2008. Remember, this would be child support that you paid, not child support that you received. One thing that's important to keep in mind is that certain words mentioned in the FAFSA can have special meanings. Let's take the word parents, for instance. With today's blended families, the term parents could apply to many people, and the FAFSA has a specific definition about who parents are. Here are some different situations. See if any of these apply to you. If your mom and dad are still married to each other, you will include information for both of them on the FAFSA. If you have one parent, say your mom is single or widowed, then you would include only her income. If your mom and dad are divorced or separated, then there are two questions to consider. First, who do you live with more, your mom or your dad? If it's your mom, then include her income. If she has remarried, also include information about her spouse. Or if you split your time equally between houses, then ask who gives you more financial support, your mom 
or your dad. If that's your dad, then include his income. If he has remarried, then also include information about his spouse. Bottom line, when filling out the FAFSA, make sure the parents you use on the form fit the FAFSA definition. Also, there are questions that ask for their personal information, such as their marital status and social security numbers. If your parents do not have social security numbers, you may enter all zeros. Wow, that's a lot of stuff to keep in mind. So let's bring out another recap. Parents and students should gather all important financial documents before filling out the FAFSA. These would include W-2s, 2008 tax returns, bank statements, and investment reports. You are not asked to provide information about your retirement accounts or the value of your home. If there's any income coming in that's not part of your regular wages, be sure and report that. Examples would include any additional financial support that the student may have received and any child support payments. And be sure and use the parents who meet the FAFSA definition, that is, the parent you live with most of the time and who financially supports you the most. If that parent is remarried, you must also include your step-parent's financial information. The journey to success hasn't been conventional or easy for Michelle Pinkett. After almost 10 years of marriage, her husband left and she was faced with raising her young sons alone. Low paying jobs were all she could find. From that point it was like, okay Michelle, it's, you're going to have to do it on your own. So that was my motivating factor, trying to prosper in life to, and also to be an example for my sons as well, to show them that even though you're faced with adversity you know, in life, you don't have to give up, you can still go forward. And so she went to college. She did little else other than work, study, and raise her children. But she had to finish. It was such a long time of going to school and homework and papers and then also raising the, you know, the boys, because I did everything on my own. I have no family here. So I was tempted to stop, but then I thought, you know what, that's not going to get you very far in life, Michelle. Despite the years and the effort it took, Michelle graduated with honors. If I had to do it all over again, I would have gone to college right after high school. College is different than high school, where you had to be really focused. You had to be really committed. Her boss, who saw her through much of it, couldn't be prouder. Some of the rates were lowered by 20 basis points. Yeah, I noticed that. Just... You know, I think it's fantastic what she's accomplished, as well as, you know, all of our employees that go on and get their education under dire circumstances, basically, you know, working all day. And I know how beat I am, and I just want to go home and rest, you know. But then to know that you've got school to attend and homework, and basically she gave up her life you know, while her social life anyway, while she was uh, attending school and, you know, we're very happy for her. Michelle is happy and relieved to have her bachelor's degree, a career with better pay and a new lease on life. But she thinks there is still more to learn. It was nonstop for seven years. And so I'm gonna take a little break, get myself, you know, physically fit and all, and then I'll probably go back and embark on the master's degree. The final step in the FAFSA is entering your school codes and signing the application. In the paper form, this is located in steps six and seven. Online, it's in steps five and seven. When you complete the FAFSA, you must enter information about the colleges you're interested in attending. On the paper form, you'll need to write the six-digit federal school code for each entry. Your high school counselor can look up these codes. If you cannot get the federal school codes, simply write the complete name, address, city, and state of the college. If you're completing the FAFSA online, simply click on Find School Code, and you can search for a school by location or name. Select the school, and it's added to your list automatically. Then, choose your housing plans for each school. The online form also allows you to review and correct any answers before submitting the FAFSA. If you have a PIN, the online application will automatically skip to the page where you submit your FAFSA. If you or your parents don't have a PIN, you will have the option to print your signature page and mail it to the Department of Education. That's all there is to it. Once you've submitted the FAFSA, here's what happens next. 
you will receive a Student Aid Report, or SAR. The report will contain the amount that your family, or you, will be expected to pay toward your college education. That's called the Expected Family Contribution, or EFC. The SAR is sent to the email address provided on the FAFSA. So, be sure to check your email regularly. If no email address is provided, the SAR will be mailed to you. The EFC is calculated using a formula. If this number seems high, don't get discouraged. Often, the school's financial aid office can work with you on an aid package that fits your financial situation. And don't wait to send in your FAFSA. Many grants and work-study programs favor early applications. And by the way, when a school awards you financial aid, it sends you an award letter. The award letter contains the type and amount of aid the school is offering. Financial aid administrators receive information from the Department of Education to help determine your financial need. Financial need is the school's cost of attendance minus the expected family contribution. Cost of attendance includes tuition and fees, books, room and board, transportation, personal expenses, and other school-related costs. While the cost of attendance varies from school to school, the EFC, the amount you or your parents are expected to pay, remains the same for each school. Some schools will wait until the admissions process is complete to send you an award letter. Remember, the admissions process is separate from the financial aid process. Read these letters carefully and correct any mistakes. They contain important instructions that you'll want to follow promptly in order to receive the financial aid offered to you. The schools you included on the FAFSA will also receive the information that is on your student aid report. Here's your final recap. Either sign and mail your FAFSA or use a pin to submit your application online. Don't delay submitting the FAFSA because some grants and work study favor early applications. You'll receive a student aid report from the Department of Education, which will include your expected family contribution. Your school will send you an award letter that will contain information about deadlines and how to accept the financial aid package they offer.